Welcome to the Friday Forum. Dr. Juan Carlos Ruiz, the Mexican culture in the context of the complex USA-Mexico relationship. Today's presentation is being recorded. See it on the Renaissance Society Forum channel on YouTube. If you have a question, you can open the Q&A by clicking on the button at the bottom of your screen. Type in your question, click send. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. We have turned the closed captioning on for this session. If you are on a Mac or PC and you would like to turn it off or on, click on the CC Live transcript button to show or hide subtitles. You can adjust the size of the closed captioning using the subtitle settings button. And now I'd like to welcome Dr. Juan Carlos Ruiz on his presentation of Mexican culture in the context of the complex USA-Mexico relationship. Hello. Hello everybody. We are going to do a poll so that we can find out how much you all know about the Mexican culture. So let's go ahead and get that poll started. There are four questions and you can select the answer by clicking on the various options. So let's start with question number one. Which phrase do you most associate with Mexico? Tourism and beautiful beaches. Food, fiesta, and tequila. Great songs and rich millenary traditions. Difficult relationship. Question two, have you ever visited Mexico? Yes, no. Do you have any Mexican heritage? Yes, no. Question four, burritos and enchiladas are the two main staple foods for Mexicans, true or false? Remember to, to get to all the questions, you can scroll down to the bottom and make sure to hit that end polling button in order for your vote to be counted. Looks like we have a lot of folks voting. Um, Juan Carlos, we do see a gray button. Oh, that's gonna be the poll that's going on right now on your screen. All right, so it looks like we're up to 111 of 135. So we're gonna give you just a couple more seconds to finish voting so that we can move on with the presentation. All right. So here are the results and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ruiz. Thank you. This is interesting. Um, a lot of you associate Mexico with food, fiesta and tequila, which is fun. Um, and however, there is still a good percentage of people that associate Mexico with a difficult relationship. That's also interesting and we will certainly cover some aspects of, of this. Um, most of you have visited Mexico. Wow, 93%, that's good. And most of you do not have a Mexican heritage. Oh, I'm pleased to know that many of you think that burritos and enchiladas are not the two main staples that Mexicans have for food. Anyways, it's interesting to see where all you're standing. Um, thank you very much. And with that, without further ado, um, let's start. So today, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Mexican culture in the context of the complex Mexico-US relationship. Uh, first of all, let me clarify one thing. When I use the word complex, I don't use it in a negative way. I don't mean this just to be negative. Um, it means that it's multidimensional. It means I have multiple components. And of course, not everything is gonna be roses and not everything is gonna be trouble, Mike. Um, we will see a little bit more about this in the, in the future. So to understand uh, how complex the relationship came to be between Mexico and the US, where, where does this relationship start? Let us go back and do a little bit of history. So, what you have here on your screens is a map of the Vice Royalty of New Spain, who was an integral territory entity of the Spanish Empire established in much of North America by the monarchy 
between the 16th and 19th centuries. It started, it originated after the fall of Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire, today in Mexico City. This is important to mention, not only because later during the talk, we will visit some of the archeological sites of Tenochtitlan and the Aztec culture, but also because for Mexico, this year is a historically very important year. It's 500 years of the falling of Tenochtitlan and the beginning of this viceroyalty territory of New Spain. But also it's the 200th anniversary of the independence of Mexico. And as you can see in this map, at some point in the history of New Spain and the United States, much of what today belongs to the United States was part of this territory, including California, which means that when we celebrate the independence of Mexico, we were also celebrating the independence or the first independence of many of the states that today lie in the US. So this vice royalty was officially created in March 8, 1535, after the fall of Tenochtitlan, as I said, and it included a massive territory. So it included just what today is US, it included California, Nevada, Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, Oregon, Washington, Florida, parts of Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana. It also included parts of Canada from what is today British Columbia, and what something that was called the Captaincy General of Guatemala, which is today Chiapas in Mexico, but also Belize, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua. It also included the Captaincy General of Cuba, which was not only Cuba, also Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, and Trinidad and Tobago and Guadalupe. And the Captaincy General of the Philippines, which included the Philippines, the Caroline Islands, the Mariana Islands in the Pacific Ocean in Asia. So it was massive. And of course, this changed over the years. First, because the Spanish territory began to expand after 1535 to compromise all these land but later because he started contracting. So during and after the Spanish colonization, this territory changed the geographical boundaries. And this is a map later in time. Um, so you can see what would used to be called the territory of the Nuevo Mexico, which was a huge chunk of the US, including Texas there. Um, during and after this colonization, um, the territory changed because of Expansion, and as you could imagine, there wasn't a lot of people in, in those lands. So uh, the Mexican government encouraged colonization of those lands, but granting land grants and citizenship to people that would like to go to places like Texas or New Mexico or California and settle there. And we can still see some of that in modern California. We have the Sutter Fort right here in Sacramento, which is one of those early settlements from uh, citizens that came from Europe and took the Mexican nationality and, and got a piece of land to do that. Then I'm not gonna get into, into details as to what this happens, but probably most of you know about the Mexican-American war between 1846 and 1848. But during this war, Mexico lost half of its territory. So by 1853, this is how Mexico looked like. So all of that that I showed before, California, New Mexico, Wyoming, the Louisiana, et cetera, was lost and only that little brown territory remained there. Um, later in 1853, through the Gadsden Treaty, La Mesilla, which is now in orange, that little piece of land, was sold to the United States for around $10 million. So you can see in green the different dates in which the United States started expanding from one coast to the other and how that correlates with a contraction of this vice royalty of New Spain and later Mexico after 1821. So today the border between Mexico and the USA spans across 1,954 1, miles. Just by virtue of sharing this large border, the relationship is going to be complicated because it means we have to cooperate in a bunch of things like border security, migration, economy, um, tourism, natural resources, and so on. So based on its size today, 
as Mexico is shown now in orange, this is a modern map of Mexico. It's the 11th largest country in the world with around 130 million inhabitants. 49% of them are male and 51 are female. That's according to the last census of 2017. Geopolitically, Mexico is situated in a very important place as well. So it's the bridge between the modern and, and Latin America and, and the elder, um, I'm sorry, and the United States, which means you've probably seen in the news that the migrations that are coming to the United States from Central America have to go first through Mexico. That also complicates the relationship between Mexico and the US and, and adds um, difficulties in terms of, of treaties and in terms of getting together uh, to, to control that. Mexico is also a global economic player. The Mexican economy is the 14th largest in the world and the second biggest in Latin America. So that, that also gives Mexico the strength to, to trade, to be a tourism, um, a tourism hub with the rest of Latin America and, and to be the bridge to the United States. So all of this adds to this multi-component complex relationship but I hope that by now it's clear that we have had a long history of frictions, wars, problems, but also a shared history of ancestry and colonization. So we have this kind of love-hate relationship that has changed over the years uh, to, to become a well-established, strong, effective relationship. And, and we have done this through what we call compartmentalization of the relationship. So there's many areas in which Mexico and the US cooperate. And this cooperation is vital for both countries because of the geopolitical importance of Mexico and because of the trade and because of the ties that unite the, the migrations. But we work together in border security, immigration, trade and business, education, tourism, and cultural diplomacy. So today I'm gonna focus mostly a little bit in tourism and cultural diplomacy, but I didn't want to leave all those other areas unexplored. So I wanted to give you this idea that compartmentalization works in a way that it, it avoids an area in which there is a conflict of interest or a friction, such as immigration, for example, to contaminate other areas in which both countries work really well. So that's kind of separated and placed aside and special commissions are formed that work over long periods of time to try to solve the issues. Meanwhile, all the other areas continue to advance. So that's how Mexico and the United States have managed to have a, a very amicable, very effective, very useful cooperation relationship in terms of other things like, like border security, trade and business. You probably know we just signed a new NAFTA II uh, treaty that is, is improved from the previous one. So uh, there's no denying that the interrelationship between the United States and Mexico, it's there, it's strong, and neither of the nations could function at this moment in time without the other because of the trade businesses, because some parts of one industry are made now in Mexico and others are made in the US. So lots of goods travel both ways multiple times before they become a finalized product. And the same with people. Millions of people study and work and cross that border in different parts on a daily basis. So that interconnection is there and it is complex, but it works well. So this map shows the about 650 miles of existing fencing or wall between the US and Mexico. Uh, you can see that in red color. And it's important to, to, for me to, to mention that the construction of this wall actually has spanned over four different administrations. It was started by Bill Clinton, a Democrat, then largely expanded by George W. Bush, a Republican, then Barack Obama, another Democrat, continued with it, and finally Donald Trump continued with it. So um, it's a policy that has transcended uh, political parties and, and is a policy that, that started there uh, from the 90s. Uh, prior to this fence, the borders were open. If you go back to 1950, there was a circular migration. And um, many studies have shown and proved that that circular migration actually worked better because people were able to come here 
do the job, the agricultural jobs, the temporary jobs, get the money and then go back home for the rest of the year. However, that stopped after the 50s and 60s when um, security at the border became uh, tighter and, and harder to cross. And people started fearing that if they left to Mexico, if they go back to their communities, then they will probably not be able to come back and have access to that uh, source of job and employment. So they started remaining here, staying here and settling down. So as a consequence um, today of this historical and more contemporary migration, around 38 million Mexicans live in the US, mostly in California, 40% of them, the population in California is uh, Mexican in origin, about 28 in Texas and Arizona, about nine to 10%. But of course there are Mexican people in other places like Nevada and Chicago and New York. Immigration status, around 65% of Hispanics. And here I wanna make the differentiation. Hispanic is a term that was created by Homeland Security here in the United States. It doesn't really mean anything to me. I don't particularly like the term Hispanic. And the reason why I don't like it is because it's a linguistical term. It's a term that applies to a language, not to an ethnicity. However, in this way, it's applied to an ethnic group, the Mexicans and the Latinos, right? They are Hispanics. Um, anyways, so the important thing is when I mean Hispanics, as you will see, most of them are Mexicans. Around 65% of the Hispanics are Mexicans. So we could well refer to them as Mexicans, but they're called Hispanics. So among Hispanics, 33% are foreign born. That means they were born somewhere else outside the US, mostly Mexico, compared with 31 of them who are US Mexicans. About 50% of foreign born Mexicans have been in the US for over 20 years. So the Mexican migration really was strong at the peak uh, around the 80s and 90s and ever since have declined. And 31% of foreign born Mexicans have also US citizenship. Okay, so today 47% of US born Latinos, another term coined by um, the, the United States. Now Latinos incorporate everybody that is uh, of a Latin language origin. So Latin American countries, think about that. And it's another term that doesn't make much sense to me because uh, from that perspective, the Italians, the Italian language, the Romanian language, the Spanish language should be Latinos because they are Latin origin as well. However, they are not included, they are white Europeans. So Latinos, think about it now, Mexicans and the rest of Latin America, 47% um, of them are younger than 18. So there's a lot of young Latinos in the US. The median age of Hispanics is 29, compared with the US population, which is 38. So Latinos tend to be younger. About 70% of US Hispanics ages five and older speak only English at home. So this myth that all Latinos only speak Spanish and they don't want to learn English, it maybe was true in the 90s when they first came, but that's no longer true. And 70%, 71% of the adults, um, also Mexican people speak English. 64% of Hispanic adults um, are English proficient and 65% of Mexicans. When it comes to education, about 16% of US Hispanics ages 25 and older have an undergrad degree compared with 12% of Mexicans. So now if you look at this, there are more Mexicans within the Hispanic group, but less Mexicans have access to higher education. So this is talking about disparities within the, the Hispanic group, which in, in, in its own, it's a minority and also suffers from unequal access to education. Among Mexicans over 25 years and old, the US born are more likely than the foreign born to have a bachelor's degree. And that is because they have more access to education, more grants, and probably also come from families that have been established here for longer and understand the system better. When it comes to welfare and income, this is data from 2017. Full-time year-round Hispanics workers earn around $34,000, while Mexican workers $32,000. So that's not very much. So as you can see, about 20% of US born Mexicans live in poverty compared with 19% of the Mexicans. Rate of home ownership among US Hispanics is 47% and 50% are Mexicans. So there's still a long ways to go to, to um, have the majority 
owners ha owning houses. Now, the, the pandemic has become hard on everybody and has complicated the entire world. But let's talk about what's happened here for those minorities, particularly the Hispanics, and how that has become more complicated and made more complicated this relationship between Mexico and the US. So of the 55 million considered essential workers across the US, that's all types of jobs, 21% are workers. So about one in every five of essential workers in every area across the US is a Hispanic. And Hispanics therefore contribute to many sectors in the economy. There is this false belief that most Hispanics, most Mexicans are only working in the agricultural fields. And it is true that a huge proportion of agricultural workers are Mexican, Hispanic in origin, but they contribute to just basically every area of the economy. So just to give you some proportions here, some examples, Hispanic essential workers represent a significant proportion, 20% in food and agriculture, 40% in commercial residential facilities and services. These are all your gardeners, cleaners, uh, cleaners at the airports, bus stations, et cetera, houses. Uh, but there's also 20% of, of Hispanics working in communications and IT, 18% in the energy sector, and in critical manufacturing, this means computers and, and cars and machines, advanced manufacturing is 20% of them. So throughout 2020, unemployment has gone through the roof. We all know that in every uh, group. But among Latinos, it grew from 4.5 unemployment rate in 2019 to 11% in 2020. That's compared to the 8.1 adjusted average unemployment for the rest of the US population. So unemployment amongst the Latino and the Hispanics have been way above the, the average of 8.1 with 11%. And also in California, Latinos represent 40% of the population, but they show the highest rates of COVID infections, 55.1, well above the demographic share, and 46.3, of the disease people are Latinos. Compare that to only around 20% and 31% of the deaths with whites. So um, they are suffering a lot during the pandemic in terms of unemployment, disease, and deaths. Now, I want to take us beyond this traditional con concept of what Mexico is as a nation and what the US is as a nation. And having done a very, very brief exploration of the history of these two nations, that they share a large proportion of the territory, that at some point they were at war, that, that at some point they have shared migrations, but then they have fought and had differences in terms of migrations, but now they work really well to solve these, these issues. Mexico and the US did not start with the Viceroyalty of New Spain. Both of our nations have a rich ancient history of traditional um, original nations. So prior to the existence of Mexico and the United States as modern nations, the American continent, that's another issue. Um, the citizens of the United States called their country America, whereas the rest of every country in the continent of America, they also feel we are Americans. So that's another point of, of difference in terms of the thought. When I say America here, I talk about the American continent. So the American continent was already a region of great cultural diversity and home to many native nations. Before European colonization, the American was already a region of opportunities. And its people have learned to adapt and coexist in dynamic environments and economic systems. What you can see here is the floating city of Tenochtitlan, which is now Mexico City. And um, the Aztecs created a way of cultivating, I'll show you later slides about this, um, directly on the water, which is extremely productive. Uh, so they were very advanced in, in, in several methods, agricultural production and sciences. But here in the US, let's just take an example in Arizona, the Canyon and the Shelly, right? This is there's archaeological evidence that suggests that the area has been inhabited for well over 5,000 years. You can see that right in the rocks, those houses, the ruins of those houses, the archaeological ruins, they were built up like rocks, same color, and they just 
come out of the rocks. So the Canyon of Vesheli, just this area in Arizona, has archaeological presence of distinct cultures um, from the archaic people. That's 2,500 years ago to about 200 BC. The basket makers, the Pueblos, the Hopi, and today the Navajos. So several cultures have inhabited there, all with different languages, with different traditions. So if we now go back to these pre-Hispanic times and try to understand the culture, where it comes from, the same has happened in Mexico. Since about 5,000 before Christ, indigenous peoples have in inhabited the North American and the Central American region, accumulating and developing some of the most advanced civilizations with unique traits. So what we have here is on the left, top left, that circular stone. It's known as the Aztec calendar, but that's, that's not really true. It's not a calendar. In reality, it's been rebaptized as the sun stone or the, the stone of the sun. And it represents the ascension to power of one of the monarchs in, in the Aztec um, kingdom. And, and we can see a jade mask there and below, we can see uh, the ball game. The ball game is an ancient game uh, that used to be played across Central America, Mesoamerica, um, with ceremonial activities. It was associated with religion and, and civil ceremonies. But these guys were very advanced. I mean, they have already numbering systems based on the number 20, advanced pottery and, and metal work, and, and calendars that track very, very closely uh, the stars. So they were very advanced cultures. So um, the area that com comprises Mexico, Guatemala, and Belize is, is referred as Mesoamerica. And is one of the three regions of the world, together with Sumeria and China, in which writing arose independently. So the Mayans wrote a very complex kind of glyph, that means drawings and, and um, geoglyphics. Um, type of, of writing that goes 2,500 years back in time. But this area also is responsible for the domestication of cocoa beans, corn, beans, chili, squash, tomatoes, avocado, vanilla, turkeys, and dogs. So a lot of the, the, the food that we eat today, we own to these people. You can see an example here on the left of this Mayan hieroglyphic type of um, writing which is uh, composed of a set of glyphs, each one of those little figures, the cacao beans, and a lot of the food that comes, that comes from there. The word Mexico in Spanish, Mexico, comes from the Nahuatl language, the Nahuatl language that the Aztecs used to speak, um, and it's Mexico. And this word comes from three different words in Nahuatl. Metzli, which means moon, shiktli, which means navel or center, and ko, place. So if you put together mechishikloko, mechiko was reduced by the Spaniards, both literally means, and metaphorically, in the navel of the moon or in the center of the lake of the moon. And as you can see, this is a, a, a picture, a drawing, of what Tenochtitlan used to be. It was literally a city floating in the lake with four main avenues coming out into mainlands. And as I said, they gained land from, from the swamps underneath by doing these floating rafts. It was very interesting, but this is how it used to look like. And that's what Mexico means. Now, um, Mexico speaks Spanish as the official language and is the second most spoken language in the world. Spanish has 560 million speakers distributed in 20 countries. And Mexico is the country where more people speak Spanish, around 121 million Spanish speakers, not counting the Mexicans in the US. If you count them, that's another 40, roughly, million people. In addition to Spanish from Mexico, uh, it, sorry, in addition to, to Spanish, the Mexican Spanish con contains several regional dialects and socialects. This means um, dialects of the Spanish language spoken by different um, social strata. So this is a map of the dialects of Mexican Spanish. And you can identify a northern one, northeastern one, northern peninsular, eastern, 
the Bahio, Central, Southern Central, Coastal, Chapaneca, Western Peninsula. The point is Spanish from Mexico is very rich and you can distinguish it by regions, just by the words, the accents, the inflections of the words. But Mexico is also rich in other languages. In addition to Spanish, there are 68 indigenous languages spoken today in Mexico, coming from 11 linguistic families. This map just shows the main ones. The five top ones are the Nahuatl, the Aztec language, the Mayan, Celtal, Mixteco, and Tzotzil. Those are the five most spoken by volume of people. And by the way, we are going to have on the 24th of February, a special event. I invite you to look at the Facebook of the Consulate General of Mexico in Sacramento. We will have a conversation about languages of Mexico, Spanish, English, and we will have a worldwide recognized Mayan poet, Jorge Miguel Cucompesh, who will be reading in Mayan some of his own poetry and writings. And that's 24th of February on Facebook. Just have a look and you will be able to hear Mayan, Zapotec, Mistake, Nahuatl. There will be songs as well. It will be interesting to, for you to hear how these languages sound. Now, um, the Mexican culture is, is, is vast. It's the product of miscegenation of the European colonization, 300 years of European essence in Mexico, along with these ancient cultures that we briefly explore now. 69 roughly different cultures. This is the Palace of Bellas Artes. It's the Cathedral of the Arts in Mexico. I think it's a very beautiful building. And um, so, as I said, Mexican culture is a product of a mixture of the indigenous practices with the traditions imposed by the Spaniards during the colonial times and forged over a long process of miscegenation that ended up in this indelible mark in every aspect of our culture. Um, this building that you can see here, the Palace of Bellas Artes, was designed by the Italian architect Adamo Boari in 1904. And it combines a neoclassic and art nouveau in the interior with art deco as well. And inside you can see murals from the famous muralist Diego Rivera and Siqueiros. And as I said, it's been called the Cathedral of the Arts in Mexico because we have international renowned um, act, um, acts playing there. Inside, this is a picture of the inside. Um, originally conceived as a fire curtain, that's what you see on the stage on the back, that glowing blue um, part in the middle of the stage. Um, there is a fire curtain that was designed out of two million pieces of two centimeters of opalescent glass each. It was made by uh, the Tiffany House in New York, and it portrays the Valley of Mexico with the two volcanoes, the, the Popocatepetl and the Ixtaccihuatl. And it's the landscape that you could see from the window outside this arts palace in the beginning of the 20th century. Now, the Mexican culture is the fruit of this historical struggle, first of the indigenous fights, then the colony, then the independence, then the national fights to, to see whether we will become a republic or we will become a monarchy, then the wars with the US and France. So um, we are not strangers to struggle, and we are a brave society that have fought to forge a cohesive identity despite living in constant political turmoil. This is a picture of our revolutionaries. Maybe the most famous one is Pancho Villa, but uh, the revolution was a social conflict at the beginning of the 20th century, 1910 to 1920s. Uh, we gave birth to our current constitution, 1917, and it's really close to um, forging the identity of the modern Mexican nation because through this social movement, we rediscover our indigenous past that have been forgotten and buried and get to know that we are really the mixture of this indigenous past with a European colonization. So the Mexican identity is built on a retrospective image of this colonial presence, uh, the wars I mentioned, and this 
very, very important social movement. This is a mural from Diego Rivera that says land and freedom, and it portrays the different classes at the beginning of the 20th century. So consequently, our art and our literature also shows this turbulent history. And it's not until after the revolution that the Mexican art began to produce some of these most acclaimed figures in the world. So this is an example of art in Mexico. This is our cathedral. It's right in the middle of Mexico. And it was constructed in the 17th century. Um, it's of plateresque and Gothic style, of a churrigueresco Baroque style with polychromatic indigenous elements. That means colorful indigenous element, elements inside and is unique in the world from that perspective. Now, this is one of my favorite ones. See how beautiful the decoration is, how exquisite it is. This is called Santa Maria Tonantzintla, and it's a church in Puebla. The city of Puebla is also a very beautiful place to visit. It's unique because of this heritage of vice-regal architecture. The indigenous people were forced to convert to the Catholic faith, the Christian faith, and so they decided when they were decorating this that they would incorporate amongst these angels and archangels and saints some of their old gods and deities. So then they were very happy to go and worship there because they were worshiping really their old gods and their old deities. And they're among these decorations. But it's a very, very unique place um, in the world. These are very common examples of architecture um, of arches in Mexico. Um, on the right, you have the palace government of Durango in the northern part of Mexico. It's an example of the Baroque. Uh, it's called Palacio Zambrano. And all over Mexico, you will find plazas like these with these arches. And on the left, you will find one of uh, the many, many convents that remain today. Most of them have been converted into schools or museums. But this used to be a Franciscan convent um, also in the city of Durango. This is an example of colonial architecture. This is also European, but, but post-colonial architecture, more modern. This is a hotel in the Mexico City, right next to the cathedral. It was built in 1899 by the Mexican ambassador in Austria, Jose de Teresa. And its Art Nouveau architectural style is unique in the world. It follows the Chicago technique as a mixture of iron and cement. You can see that gorgeous elevator right in the middle of those beautiful roofs. If you ever go to Mexico, it has a beautiful bar that just sits out in the cathedral. You can have a tequila there, wonderful place to visit. But of course, Mexico also has modern architecture as these skyscrapers, more like you're used to seeing the Chicago area or New York. And on the right, this is one of the modern museums. The Samoya Museum has uh, art of uh, different periods of Mexico, but just to show that Mexico is now a mixture of ancient and modern architecture. Okay, so traditional Mexican folkloric dance and music, which you've probably seen in terms of mariachis and stuff, are the products of this mixed indigenous and European heritage. This is an example of what is called teponantzin. It's a drum from the Nahuatl people. It's a carved piece of wood, a trunk, beautifully carved, and then they hit it with the sticks and produces a very nice uh, hollow sound. And they used to do it to dance and uh, recitate poetry. From this kind of instrument, we also have on the right is called marimba. It's a kind of wooden xylophone uh, with multiple layers, and it can be played as a solo or as an ensemble. This is very typical of the Mayan area of Chiapas and the Yucatan Peninsula. And again, is a mixture of European music with indigenous arts. But of course, Mexico is also world renowned for making guitars. There is a little town in Michoacan called Paracho, and this is one of the artisans that makes guitars by hand, and, and it's a place where guitars are very cheap, but they're extremely high quality. Many of these guitars make it into the world concert halls of, the, of, of Spain and, and France for the flamenco and, and those kinds of music that requires acoustic guitars. Now, uh, most of the original dances of the indigenous people of Mexico were adapted during the colonial period and, and, and or suppressed because they represent religious icons. So um, the ones that remain today 
are the product of this miscegenation. This is a very famous one. You see these people are wearing masks that are funny and they are mocking. This was a dance created by the indigenous people to mock the Spaniards. So they are wearing white masks to mock them and they dance with wooden sandals. So they clack a lot and they wear like little wooden sticks and it's called the dance of the old people. But it's a very profound symbological dance for, for the indigenous people that has a salutation to the north, south, west, and east. And it was used to done dance for, for agricultural purposes. This is one of the most beautiful dances. It's called the, the eagle dance. You can see this massive jump and that beautiful hairdress of the guy is wearing, pretending to be an eagle, an eagle being a sacred animal of these traditions. And they, they were used to tell the stories, the cosmology of original group and contributed to create this national identity of each nation of Mexico. This is another one of, of those beautiful, beautiful dances. These are called the flying people of Papantla. So these four guys climb a 60, 70 foot uh, tall pole. In this case, it's a metal pole, but they used to do them with a tree, cut a piece of wood and do it. And while the guy at the top is playing a little a flute and a drum sitting on top of that. that. That structure goes around and these guys start unfolding the rope and flying down to the ground. So it's really a beautiful dance and it's called the Flying People of Papantla. And now it has incorporated Christian elements like, you know, the four cardinal points are now the cross of the Christianity and so on. But this is also related to the identity and the environment. Of course, some of you might have seen these type of dances which are the amalgamation of European um, styles, such as the Huapangos, the Jota from Spain, the Sambras, and the Zapateado, and have raised to these iconic dances like the Jarabe Tapatio, the, the Tapatio Jarocho from the region of Veracruz and these colorful dresses. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna give you one minute of um, a little bit of the carnival in Veracruz, this is in the Gulf of Mexico, from a city called Placotalpan, so you can get a sense of the beautiful zapateado and the colorful music and the beautiful dances. So I'll be quiet for a minute and then I will continue explaining this, just to let you see in this. So that's given you a little bit of a taste of this beautiful rhythmic music and the flirting between men and women, which embodies really this spirit of the Mexican people, which is playful, which is full of rhythms and colors, and those uh, European dances made in Mexican style now. Um, I'm going to quickly go through this because I'm going to run out of time if I do it in detail, but many of you said that you knew that the Mexican food was much more than burritos and tacos, so thank you. Yes, Mexican cuisine is considered an intangible cultural heritage of humanity because of many reasons. So what makes this Mexican cuisine unique? Well, it's old roots. We already spoke about that. Uh, the ancient heritage of our ancestors who have survived in this miscegenation and the passage of time. Many of those dishes we still cook today as they used to do. These are two instruments that they used to cook. Many people in Mexico do that. That's on the right is petate and is used to grind the, the corn with the stone. It's an invention of the Mexican people. 
And on the left below is a comal, this is round big cooking thing. You can do those panuchos. Those, those are directly evidence of the uh, agricultural and, and cuisine work of our ancestors. For his role as an identity element, so Mexican food is like Mexicans. It is colorful, extravagant, cheerful, and very creative. You can see some salsas there, four different kinds of hundreds of types. Some of the chiles are result from the domestication process, also hundreds of chiles. And, and that creates different dishes because of its cultivation methods. Remember that I talked to you about this special way of cultivating that the Aztecs had to reclaim land from the water is called chinampas. They are still used today and they're very, very productive. And so, so usually these are these floating rafts, which are basically branches tied together with mud taken from the bottom of the lake. And in the larger ones, they plant a willow so the roots can prevent these from moving away and you can tie up several together to create a, a larger area of land. And they're growing their carrots and lots of other um, different products that grow very nicely in the water. Also because of its exotic combination. So only in Mexico, we use chocolate to make a spicy sauce, mole, or unconventional ingredients like with la coche, which is a uh, fungus that grows in the corn, and a variety of insects. So here's an example. So mole right there and chicken, that gray kind of not very appealing looking is the fungus, but believe me, it's delicious. And insects such as this one at the bottom, we, we eat them. Because of our dream, so down below on the left, we have tequila. In the middle, we have something that is called pozol. It's made of cacao beans with ground uh, corn. It's from the Mayan region, Chiapas. And then on the right, we have what is called pulque, which is made with fruits. You can see this one is made of pineapple. So we also have these drinks because of its diversity. So the gastronomy of Mexico is a great collective of regional varieties and culinary traditions. So just to give you an example, uh, on the left, you have these chilies with white sauce on top, delicious. They are called um, chile relleno. Uh, particularly this one, it's called, uh, is a national dish of Mexico. It's called chile nogada and it's from Puebla. In the middle, we have cochinita pibil, it's Yucatecan food. And on the right, we have the pozole, which is uh, Oaxacan. So very, very different in regions. So these regional cuisines um, open to multiple, multiple varieties of way of cooking and plate. Tourism is very important in Mexico and connects us with the US. In 2019, 23 million US citizens visited Mexico and around 19 million Mexican citizens traveled to the United States. Obviously 2020 was a difficult year. And many of you said that you associate Mexico with these white sandy beaches that you go Cancun, one of the most known places. In 2019, tourism contributed around 9% of the GDP in Mexico. That's about $25 billion. So tourism is very important. And it's very important not only because beaches, Mexico has 35 UNESCO World Heritage Sites. These are some of them. Some of them are because of um, ancient cultures like the pyramids, others because of the colonial traditions. On the top left, you have Xochimilco, which is what survives of the ancient canals of Mexico City in that lake. And then you can go and see ecotourism, like watch the whales in Baja California, go to the um, desert parks or beautiful historical cities like Colima below and Puebla on top. So ecotourism is another attraction. Yes, we have beautiful beaches, but Mexico is an attractive de destination because we have 440 beaches, but we have 50,000 archeological sites, 67 ecological parks, 34 reserves, 17 sanctuaries, and four natural monuments. This is in the area of Cancun and see how beautiful it is. You can go snorkeling, diving and see the nature there in the uh, jungle. Now, there are many giants of the Mexican culture. Mexican artists have left their mark creating some of the most iconic influences in universal culture. Probably all of you recognize Frida Kahlo on the top left there and her husband Diego Rivera below. There are many others. I'm not going to stop there to explain you, but I'm just going to say, and this will be available for you to watch. So if you want to go and read who Sor Juana was, I would strongly invite you. It's one of the first feminists in the world. She was a nun, and she endured misogynistic attacks for being a woman, a scholar, a nun, and a writer. 
Frida Kahlo is also an icon of the Mexican painting, but also of the LGBTQ community. And her house is visited by thousands, millions of people every year, and also left a big influence in the Chicago area. Octavio Paz was a diplomat, poet, and um, Nobel Prize laureate. Um, so he, he's very well recognized for his book, um, Cien Años de Soledad. Daniela Soto is a contemporary um, chef, and she was mentioned in the 50 best restaurants in the world, awarded by the British publication. And at her young age of 20 years old, she's already one of the top chefs in the world. And this is Elisa Carrillo. Elisa Carrillo has won um, 14 one medals, and she's the first Mexican to obtain the title of first dancer from the most important companies in the world, the Staatsballet from Berlin. And, and to win the Prix Venoir, which is a dance prize comparable to the Oscars. So with this, I just want to say that Mexican culture is very much alive, vibrant, continues to influence not all, only because of the millennial traditions, but today the art. And I will be a, doing a disservice to you if I wouldn't speak about that tradition and the Chicano movement. Maybe many of you are uh, acquainted with the Chicago movement, but in the 60s, there was a period of thought analysis and the action for Mexican descended people in the United States um, that issued deep resonance within the Mexican American communities and were brought forward by multiple socio-political mobilizations. So there was a battle of, for self-determination and cultural reclamation of that Mexican heritage uh, that seeped into this national conscious consciousness known as the Chicano movement. Um, the Chicano art movement, also termed the Chicano Renaissance, used art as part of their struggle to achieve uh, more credible values and represent Mexican heritage and the American way of living for those new Mexican migrants. So Chicanos proclaimed the self-invention within a project that connected visual arts like these murals, but also poets, musicians, dancers to various political fronts of El Movimiento, of the movements. And I want to say that one of the probably most famous Chicano movement is uh, Pollock, and he was strongly um, influenced by Diego Rivera and the muralist in Mexico. This is uh, directly uh, the, the contribution of the muralists like Diego Rivera and Citeros in the art of the Chicano movement. So by mid 70s, the Chicano artists have produced visual education, posters and murals, this strong iconography um, to, to, to pursue the vital task of creating um, art that will strengthen and fortify the cultural identity of these Mexican descendant and Mexican born and Mexican migrants and the consciousness of the new community. So, but I, I, I wanted to, to follow that. This is not just in the 60s, just like the history of Mexico and the US that is connected centuries back. And the Chicano movement started before. So on the left, you have this lady called Jovita Idar Viveras. She was born in Texas. And at the beginning of the 19th century, she was already campaigning for access to education for Mexican women descended. She was um, Mexican American and worked as a journalist, but also she was one of the founders and, and director of La Liga Femenil Mexicanista. So she started even 18th and 19th to the 19th century. In the middle, you have Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez, that's more modern. He was a Chicano a boxer, a poet, a fighter in the Chicago area for, for the freedom of, of movement. And then on the right, you have um, Reyes Tijerina, um, born in Texas and fought for land rights for, for the Mexican Texan descendants and the Spanish descendants that were dispossessed during the American expansion. But of course, Perhaps the most well-known is the movement of Cesar Chavez um, through, through in, in California and Dolores Huerta and all the agricultural farm workers that would they achieve for equal payment and recognition of Mexican people. So I want you to, I want to leave just by saying that Mexico and the United States continue to be linked together through political work, migration, education, trade and business, but also through art. And through that education that goes hundreds of years back, and even the Aztecs 
are believed to have descended from the Ute people in the, uh, in the, in the region of um, the Grand Canyon. The, the Nahuatl language is a Ute Azteca language from that uh, family. So the links go hundreds of years back and will continue to be hundreds of years in the future because we have this strong dependency and have found a way to cooperate as nations. With that, I'm gonna leave it and I thank you for your attention. Thank you for being here today. Any questions or comments? Yes, uh, Dr. Bora, though I was, uh, we only have three or four minutes left, but I want to read what one of the comments said, your talk could be used as the basis for an entire semester class on Mexico and its history, culture, and people. And I want to second that you covered 2000 years in 50 minutes. So it was a lot of material and very well presented, really interesting. A quick answer maybe, I had a couple of questions from people about describing again, the difference between Hispanic and Latino. Can you mm -hmm. say that very quickly? Yes, so the terms that exist now, they are Latino, which refers to a person that has a Latin origin. That includes all the Latin American countries so Mexico and the rest of the Americas, all of them, except for the United States and Canada. That's a Latino. Then Hispanic includes also Spain because they speak Spanish, but the Spanish people are not Latino in the term. And that's one of these confusing things because of course Spanish language is a Latin origin language. And so is Italian and so is the Romanian. But none of them are Hispanics, none of them are Latino. So you have Latins as Latin America, Hispanics as somebody that speaks Spanish, including Spain, and also you have the Chicano, and the Chicano are Mexican descendant born in the US that identify with this new culture that comes from the US, Mexican, European tradition. And that's what the Chicano is. So Great, we'll thank you, that, that helps clarify those three. A quick reminder, someone, uh, a couple of people have asked about the February 24th Facebook presentation. Could you say what the name of that is or a way that they could look that up? Do you know? Yeah, I didn't say. So um, we will have, we are celebrating the National Day of Indigenous Languages and the International Day of the Modern Tongues. So we will be talking in Spanish, English, and the poet will be talking in Mayan language. And that's what we'll be reading some of that poetry in the three languages. So it's called A Celebration of the Mother Tongues and the indigenous languages of Mexico. If you go to the Facebook on the Consulate General of Mexico, which is Consul Mexac, Consul Mexac, um, you will find it there on the 25th uh, at around five o'clock. It will remain there if you cannot see it on the 25th, but um, that's when it's gonna happen. Great, that sounds really good. And I, I think we don't have time for any more questions at this point, but you covered a lot of material and we really appreciate all the time that you took. And I. I do hope we can talk you into teaching a class next semester. Oh, I will be delighted. I will absolutely be Great. delighted. Great. So much to talk about Mexico and the US. I deliberately didn't want to go through some of the more complicated parts of the relationship because it wouldn't have given me time. But yes. of course, not everything is roses. They are conflict, there are problems, there are frictions. And we have to work as nations to, to fix them and to come uh, to, to uh, ways to diplomatically work together and fix this situation. And we do. Good. We do from administration to administration. And sometimes it's closer, sometimes it's further away. But the work continues. And it's my pleasure to, to always talk to you about Mexico and, and their well, very we, good relationship. With we look forward to continuing the conversation. I'll turn it over to Lori. Yes. And I, I also want to echo that. This time went by and it felt like five minutes. It was so entertaining and educational and we really appreciate it. Um, we also wanna let you know that the Renaissance Society has made a generation or a donation of $25 to the Seth Nelson Student Emergency Grant Fund as a token of our appreciation. Fantastic. And this is a, a fund that assists students who experience financial emergency or unanticipated expenses so that we can keep them in college. Anyway, a uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for doing it for the Renaissance Society. We wanna remind everyone else that today's presentation was recorded and it will be available for viewing later on the Renaissance Society 
Forum channel on YouTube and on the Renaissance website. So if you'd like to watch it again, you can see it there. And then finally, I want to talk about our pre presenter for next week. That's going to be another interesting forum. Detective Matthew Dew is going to talk about what you need to know about computer crimes and elder fraud. Again, I want to thank all of the members that joined us. We had quite a large attendance today. Uh, everyone have a wonderful day, and we will see you next Friday.